panel this afternoon is an old friend who is a very, very familiar face at the... Uh, I wasn't going to say long, I was, but a uh, very, very familiar face here at the Dialogues, of course, Leila Sadat. Professor Sadat is the Henry H. Overshelp Professor of Law and Israel Treman Faculty Fellow at Washington University School of Law and has been the director of the Whitney R. Harris World Law Institute since 2007. And so I will now turn it over to Layla. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Lovely. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> this is Chautauqua, after all. <laughs> Um, it's really lovely to be back here again. Uh, I don't want to jinx the weather, but it has been uncommonly fine every time we've come. Uh, I'm really grateful for your presence at this afternoon's panel. It has been a very, very rich morning, and I know that there's probably some pent-up demand for audience intervention, so my panelists have graciously suggested that we will use less of our time than allotted and open up the floor to dialogue um, sooner. I want to say that yesterday, as I was flying here from St. Louis, which shouldn't take that long, except that it does take that long because there are no nonstop flights, I had the opportunity to read the Sunday New York Times from cover to cover, which is an unusual event in my house with three children. And Tom Friedman's column, did anybody see it? Yeah, unbelievably timely vis-a-vis -vis the subject of this. It's called Order Versus Disorder, Part 3. And he talks about, and I'll just read a little bit from the column. He says, the United States is swamped by refugee children from collapsing Central American countries. Efforts to contain major Ebola outbreaks in West Africa are straining governments. Jihadists have carved out a bloodthirsty caliphate inside Iraq and Syria. After having already eaten Crimea, Russia keeps taking bites out of Ukraine, and the United Nations Refugee Agency just announced, as we heard earlier, that the number of refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people worldwide has, for the first time, exceeded 50 million people. Against that kind of disorder, which he says, if you're feeling like there's disorder, it's because there is, he posits in the column, which is well worth reading, that one of the causes is that many of the institutions that were containing these activities have collapsed, and no institutions and legal rules that would flow from those institutions with the force of authority have come to replace them. That, in a sense, is the subject of our panel today, which is what is the relevance of international humanitarian law in addressing disorder in the world. And I hope that we won't just be pessimistic and say things like, well, it's not relevant because nobody's using it, but talk uh, a little bit about the ways in which international humanitarian law can help even if not completely contain disorder, add some dimension or at least some objective uh, elements to our conversations about it. After all, if national systems are collapsing, one hope for international law is that international law can actually sort of transcend the collapse of the national system and hold some space for that national system as the national system rebuilds itself. So here to discuss, and we've decided to use a question format rather than formal presentations, uh, here to discuss some of the issues now regarding international humanitarian law and its relevance in an increasingly disordered world are three extraordinarily qualified individuals who no, need really no formal introduction, but just uh, for just to say a couple words about each of them. Each is a friend and a colleague and a tremendous expert. Um, to my left, your right, Ambassador Hans Karel, former Under Secretary General and Legal Counsel of the United Nations for 10 years, a judge in Sweden, um, a member of my Crimes Against Humanity Initiative Steering Committee, uh, and he also served as Secretary the Secretary General's representative to the diplomatic conference in Rome that established the International Criminal Court. On my right, Professor William Chavis, formerly uh, director of the Irish Center for Human Rights, 
um, Queen's Council, I think, in Canada, now a professor at Middlesex College in London, and one of his many, many accomplishments was a member of the Truth Commission uh, for Sierra Leone, and now most recently appointed head of the United Nations Committee investigating um, the Israeli-Gaza conflict. And finally, to my right, Ambassador David Sheffer, uh, the United States' first ambassador for war crimes, really, who created that position, David, now a professor at Northwestern University School of Law, where he also directs an astonishing and amazing human rights clinic that does some fantastic work. The United Nations Secretary General's um, Special Rapporteur in Cambodia, I think, Rapporteur for the Cambodia Tribunal, and an expert on humanitarian law. So we're going to proceed by way of questions, and we have about five or six questions that will, one of the panelists will respond first, then the other panelists will respond to the first speaker, and then after that initial round of questioning, which hopefully will get everyone's uh, intellectual juices flowing, we're gonna open it up to the audience and have a fuller dialogue. So our first question, which I'll direct to Ambassador Hans Corell, how relevant is international humanitarian law to the work of the Security Council today? Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Thank you. Well, as a matter of fact, this is one of the most important questions one could put, in my view. I followed the Council for 10 years at very close range in the UN, and after that I followed them at a close range, as close as I could. As a matter of fact, the United Nations Security Council is the main actor in this field. Why? Because first of all, we have the question how they themselves behave when we come to international humanitarian law. And the other element is how do they deal with situations where there are problems in this field. And of course the whole idea with the Security Council that has the mandate by the members of the United Nations to have the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security they have an obligation, actually, under the state, uh, statute, uh, under the Charter of the UN, to deal with these issues. And how do they perform? In my view, they very often fail, and fail miserably. And to me, it's mind-boggling that these five, pe five permanent members, in particular, don't understand that they have a responsibility that means that they have to learn to define their interest, their national interest, in a more broad perspective than one would usually do at the national level. They have to reach out. And of course, the whole purpose of what we are dealing with here, international humanitarian law and international criminal law and so forth, is not only to punish those who commit crimes, but primarily, as with all criminal law, to prevent crimes. And this is where the Council could do a formidable work if they performed under the Charter as they should. As a matter of fact, I was so frustrated when I heard all the talks about reforming the Security Council, and only aspect of that work was to extend the membership of the Council. I think that would be one of the most effective means of shooting a torpedo into the collective Security Council or the UN Charter, the security system in the UN Charter. I mean, the Security Council can never be democratic in the sense that everybody sits on it. The Security Council is an executive organ, and by definition, an executive organ has to be rather small. If you ask the business community, they would say already 15 members is a lot. Now, if we could stay at 15 members and then have these 15 members actually performing in accordance with the laws that we're discussing here and bowing their heads in particular to the very law they are set to supervise, namely the UN Charter, I think the world would be literally a world of difference. What I would hope is that the Council realizes that they cannot continue behaving as they do. And I'm not accusing all the members, and we have Prince Zaid here, of course, who is now one of the members of the Council representing his country here, but basically it's the permanent five who are calling the cards. Now, I suggested to them back then that in 2008 that they should adopt the resolution under which they should do four things. Number one, from now on, we are actually going to bow to the law that we are supervising, namely the UN Charter. Number two, we are not going to use our veto 
unless our innermost national concerns are at hand, and that disqualifies almost everything that's going on today. Number three, we are not going to use force unless in the two situations allowed by the Charter, namely self-defense or after a clear and unambiguous resolution by the Security Council. And number four, responsibility to protect. If a country a state is unable to prevent that their citizens are subjected to genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing, then they should act. And as a matter of fact, I think that what the Council has to do is to draw a line and demonstrate to the world that if anyone passes this line, we have in the Council an obligation to intervene and we will do it. If they did this, I think they would send a signal around the globe that would reverberate really and that this would make a difference and the warlords would start looking at themselves and say, well, maybe, maybe they will come after me if I commit violations here. It's extraordinary that almost exactly five years ago, Richard Goldstone delivered his report from the Middle East. And of course, I knew that the matter would be discussed also in the Security Council. And the, the report, of course, was criticized even before it was tabled. I wrote to the Council a letter and said that this is a matter between the Rapporteur and the Human Rights Council. But you, as a Security Council, have a responsibility of your own. You should take the initiative. And the accusations crossing the lines here in the Middle East, there's only one way to find out what is criminal and what is not criminal, and that is to have a court look at it. So I suggested they should appoint or ask the ICC to address the situation to defend the humanitarian law element here. Of course, nothing happened. If they had done something, maybe we wouldn't have had today the situation that means that now William Shabas is appointed a new rapporteur and will come back. Maybe some of the actors that have orchestrated the violence here had been, shall we say, not at large today. And I think this is where the Council has such an extremely important responsibility. Shortly on the second element, their own performance. Here, of course, we see that sometimes members of the Council violate the Charter. We had the attack on Iraq back in 2003 when I was still at the UN. Our hearts sank on the 38th floor when we saw what was happening. And then, of course, the attack on Georgia in 2008, and now Ukraine, the latest. Do we live in the 19th century? A permanent member of the Security Council is actually violating the most fundamental elements, not only of the UN Charter, but also of the Helsinki Accords, where the then Soviet Union, now Russia, was one of the main actors in introducing the system, which was so beneficial for Europe. So I must say, I, I lack statesmanship. And let me end on the note. Why is it so difficult to transfer wisdom from one generation to another? Already Sophocles understood this. Let me end by quoting the final choir in his tragedy, Antigone. Wisdom is the supreme part of happiness, and venerance for the gods is a must. But on mighty men, with mighty words in their mouths, the gods will strike with mighty blows and teach in old age the chastened to be wise. Why don't they understand their responsibility? Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Um, David or Bill, do you have anything to add, particularly maybe on areas in which the council could do better or specific mm -hmm. examples? David? Well, I might chime in. Um, first of all, it's great to be back at Chautauqua and seeing so many familiar faces. Um, I think Hans has pointed out the, the perils of inaction by the Security Council as well as actions in violation of international law by certain permanent members of the Security Council. I want to just add to that two additional points and then turn the coin around a little bit. First, the inaction continues to be one of the Security Council not being willing to incentivize the General Assembly to fund international criminal court uh, situations which have been referred by the Security Council to the ICC but without well, frankly, with, with provisions in those referral resolutions 
that state, uh, uh, member states are not uh, uh, obligated through the UN to provide any financing for these particular investigations. That has become, I think, now a, a lodestone of irresponsibility by the Security Council with respect to its referrals, and it's simply becoming an implausible uh, strategy for referrals to the ICC. The ICC obviously needs funding in order to undertake massive investigations, whether it be in Darfur or Libya. But once again, we saw the paragraph uh, crop up in the Syria referral that was defeated by a veto, by two vetoes. Nonetheless, there it was. Um, so that's a, that's a distinct failure by the Security Council. Um, second is the failure to take tough enforcement action to actually incentivize cooperation with the International Criminal Court, which needs it. As we heard this morning from Prosecutor uh, Ben Suda, there has to be uh, timely and effective cooperation by particularly states' parties to the request by the International Criminal Court. The Security Council never really takes up the challenge of, of sort of bonding with the ICC to incentivize nations to uh, uh, implement those cooperative measures, uh, including, in particular, those situations that actually have been referred by the Security Council to the ICC. I want to turn the, flip the coin very briefly and just say, yes, there's a lot of bad news here, but there's also needs to be a recognition that the Security Council does not completely ignore international humanitarian law. It has been on deck with international humanitarian law in a very real way for 20 years now with the creation of the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals, with the participation in the creation of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the engagement it has uh, off and on with the, uh, Europe, uh, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, mostly in terms of letting the process move forward without obstruction. Um, those are all signals from the Security Council that international humanitarian law is certainly uh, something that they've put uh, considerable focus on in certain situations uh, to achieve some degree of accountability. And we can credit the Security Council, I think, for at least having the political will to do that. Um, since 2005, it's also interesting to look at the resolutions that have come out of the Security Council as they relate to the ICC, because that too is an indication of, is the Security Council on top of international humanitarian law issues as they are, be, are being addressed by the ICC. Um, and it's interesting that in addition to the two referral resolutions, Syria, I mean, um, Darfur and uh, Libya. Um, there have been 29 resolutions since uh, 2005 where the Security Council positively notes the ICC and in some cases supports the court's work and its objectives in the language of those resolutions. And since 2007, there have been 26 presidential statements by the Security Council, which are unanimous statements. They're non-binding, but they're still unanimous in which, again, the International Criminal Court has been referred to favorably by the Security Council. And I'll end on this note. In the year 2014, we've seen three resolutions now uh, in, um, in the spring uh, relating to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the uh, Central African Republic, and Mali, and the peacekeeping operations in those countries by the UN whereby the Security Council actually has language that authorizes the peacekeeping forces to work cooperatively with the national governments on arrest operations of uh, individuals who are uh, uh, implicated in war crimes but also uh, might be uh, indicted fugitives from the International Criminal Court. So that's kind of a large step for the Security Council. It's a mini step and of course uh, they had the opportunity after the first of these resolutions to do it for Darfur, and they didn't take it. They left Darfur alone on that issue of arrest. But it nonetheless shows some movement uh, that I think uh, we should try to build on in the future. Very interesting. Bill, could you make a slide? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting to reflect on the origins of the International Criminal Court and how our vision of the role of the Security Council has evolved, I think, or our understanding of how it contributes to the International Criminal Court. 
20 years ago when the International Law Commission was crafting the first draft of the statute, the view was that this would be a court more or less uh, a permanent version of the Yugoslavia or Rwanda tribunal, something created uh, by the Security Council and uh, controlled and, and ultimately uh, uh, put to an end by the Security Council, as is the case with the ad hoc tribunals, at least with Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Then as the idea of the independent prosecutor emerged, we had this idea there would be different ways of, of, uh, of triggering the jurisdiction of the court, but many people believed that the Security Council would remain the main part of it and that the court really was unlikely to be able to operate without referrals from the Security Council, that that would be the only way to give real meat to its activity. And I remember uh, the first president of the court, uh, Philippe Kirsch, when the, when the resolution of the Security Council, uh, the first resolution referring a situation, this is the Darfur situation, 31 March uh, 2005, and he was troubled, as we all were, by these perverse clauses that were in the resolution about the, the denial of funding from the, uh, from the um, uh, from the United Nations and the carve out of jurisdiction which although probably was insignificant in terms of its practical consequences still was just rather disgusting to have put into a resolution and he uh, Philippe's attitude was kind of you know we need this to get the court working let's just hold our noses and get on with it so here we are nine years later finally we don't need the Security Council referrals at all uh, if we were to remove them from Fatou Ben Souda's uh, uh, list of files on the top of her desk, she'd probably heave a sigh of relief and say, I've got enough work to keep me busy without them. And in any case, they haven't really delivered a great deal um, in terms of work. And it's, what's interesting is that the court seems to work just fine if we have referrals by states' parties and the proprio modo activity of the prosecutor. We couldn't have known that 10 or 15 years ago, but it seems to be the case today and give them back to the Security Council, say, create your own damn tribunal. <laughs> at least then, I mean, I'm haunted by the vision of poor Fatou sitting here alone at future <laughs> dialogues, and, and, and then we're going to ensure that we have a panel here with several people if we insist that the Security Council create new tribunals if it wants to set up criminal prosecution. I'm being a bit mischievous, as, as you, you know me well enough. So. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to my second question, but as you can see, when we talk about international humanitarian law for the non-specialists in the audience, we're not only talking about the legal principles that is codified in treaties, Geneva Conventions, and Genocide Convention, and my imagined future Crimes Against Humanity Convention, um, but we're also talking about the courts that enforce international humanitarian law and the relationship of those courts to various other actors. Well, my second question um, is how relevant is this law and these courts, maybe David, to foreign policy making today? And David Sheffer, you have the first bite of this question. Well, I enter this with trepidation because we have so many individuals in this room, including my good colleague Steve Rapp and Jane Stromseth and others who are in the middle of policy circles right now. So who am I to speak on this issue? But <clears throat> certainly from my experience and from my observations in more recent years, I think I just want to make a few points. First, we do need, when we look at this issue of foreign policy making, to distinguish between international law per se and international humanitarian law. They are two overlapping but also distinct bodies of law. When you're at the policy table in governments, you're typically talking about compliance with or violation of international law, namely territorial issues and trade issues and things of that nature where you're making tough decisions in policy making circles about state responsibility for governmental action that uh, can be military, but if it's military, it's more in the vein of violating the sovereignty of another nation, uh, you know, confronting issues, self-defense issues, etc. cetera. Um, so if we're focusing this on the relevance of foreign policy making with respect to international humanitarian law, which deals with armed conflicts and generally the protection of civilians and other non-combatant individuals, uh, POWs, et cetera, um, 
that is a, that's a different calculus at the policy table, and I would argue that um, I sort of view this in three categories of, of governments that may be a way to, to get our grips around this. One would be those governments that come to the policy table on this more narrow issue of international humanitarian law um, with a, a view of complete compliance. I mean, of course, how could anyone imagine violating the Geneva Conventions, uh, et cetera, in uh, the performance of our military forces overseas, uh, or even if you're not performing in militarily, we're gonna hold everyone else to complete compliance with the treaties of international humanitarian law. Uh, just think of the Nordic countries and, and you know exactly where I am. Secondly, would be those countries that view this issue with a sense of partial compliance, or shall we say complete compliance unless circumstances require otherwise. And there you can get into all sorts of situations. I mean, you can go all the way back to India and East Pakistan. You can go back to the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia to uh, stop the Pol Pot atrocities. You can go back, of course, to 2003 and the US and British invasion of Iraq and what was going through everyone's mind about, well, wait a minute, we're gonna make some compromises on international humanitarian law because, you know, we, that's a whole debate. And so uh, those are sort of partial compliance situations and I think at the policy table, um, there is some discussion about that but also it's, it's discussions that take place probably more in the shadows than, than uh, in terms of real policy making. Uh, in my mind on partial compliance, by the way, I sort of divide that whole issue between those countries with good faith that are executing humanitarian interventions or responsibility to protect actions um, or trying to on R2P uh, uh, and whether that has any IHL implications. And of course, those who simply are in a totally different sphere of thinking, the, the, the so-called war on terror, where you have a, a rogue element that, that just takes control of the situation. Then you have this third category, which I think is one of the most interesting and frankly is the hot subject of our times, and that's the no compliance category. And these are a lot of non-state actors, non-state actors, but boy, do they dominate the situation. ISIS, or ISIL, uh, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram in Nigeria, and also even on the state level, you know, you can start talking about North Korea or even Zimbabwe. I mean, these are countries where at the policy table, you probably have to imagine that international humanitarian law is the, one of the last things they are thinking about complying with. They have other objectives in mind. So as we talk about this, uh, I just kind of posit those sort of categories of countries and how policy making might evolve within them. Lovely, Bill, anything to add? Just, well, just a reflection here, listening to David, um, I think he's right. Certainly in, in areas like, for example, development assistance and so forth, the governments would look very carefully at the situation in, the, in other states. And I see also the political debate that government is challenged when they see that the country continues to have shall we say, connections with another state and the reports are coming in that this state is violating international humanitarian law standards. So I think in a sense it's, it's always present in some way and in sometimes it, 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 it is transformed into articles in the newspapers and challenges to ministers in the parliament to answer questions and so forth. So definitely if people are aware of the existence of international humanitarian law. And I think this goes to our overall point, which is countries with strong institutions and strong formal procedures to get international humanitarian law into the conversation are more likely to consider it as opposed to countries that don't or where they're non-state actors. Um, third question, which we'll ask Bill here, what is the relationship between international humanitarian law and international human rights law in times of armed conflict? And this is, this is a biggie. <laughs> yes, it's a, it really requires an entire afternoon to, to discuss it. Well, you, you have five minutes. Five or ten minutes, okay. <laughs> or maybe seven. It, you know, Six. I was thinking that if, if Robert Jackson were, were here today and he heard us use the term international humanitarian law, he would be puzzled by what it means. Mm -hmm. he would, it wouldn't be familiar to him. Uh, I think it's, 
been established that the term started being used in the uh, early 1950s. And uh, what it was was an attempt to uh, inject human rights content into the law of armed conflict. And that was in the context in which this expression started being used. And it's been used in a variety of contexts. I, I suspect also that probably many people here in this room who are not specialists in the field are even a little puzzled that we, we even ask the question, the relationship between human rights law and international humanitarian law, because they probably think they're actually much of the same, and, and in many ways they are. That's not an unreasonable uh, observation or conclusion. But in a technical sense, it's not entirely accurate. We muddy the waters as well with the term in institutions like the ad hoc tribunals, which claim that their jurisdiction is to deal with serious violations of international humanitarian law, and then we give them jurisdiction over crimes against humanity and genocide, which we know can be committed in time of peace. So there's no requirement there. There's no, it's not really humanitarian law in the sense that it deals with armed conflict at all. And if we get to the International Criminal Court, the war crimes, part of it, the, 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 the international humanitarian law in the strict sense is, is in a way a small piece. It takes a lot of space in the Rome Statute because the definition is very long. But really the, uh, the core crimes and most of the prosecutions at all of these institutions are about crimes against humanity a little bit about genocide, a little bit about pure war crimes, and eventually, not far away now, uh, uh, the crime of aggression. Uh, so there is a debate that's been going on for many years about the relationship between the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law and the associated body of, of human rights law, which certainly applies in peacetime. It was argued that it also applies in wartime, but the, op the opponents of that view said, when it's wartime, we just look at the international humanitarian law. That was a view 20 years ago that many defended, but I think that has now been pretty clearly rejected by authoritative bodies like the International Court of Justice. And they've said that there's a relationship between the two of them that they both can apply in times of armed conflict, human rights and humanitarian law. And so the challenge is to sign up, tease that out and figure out exactly how they, uh, how they uh, interact. Uh, I wrote something on this some years ago that, where I talked about what I called the belt and suspenders approach. Uh, since I've been living in the UK, I've, have to, I've learned that you, you're misunderstood if you talk about a belt and suspenders because the suspenders are what women wear and uh, not what we think of as, you have to say braces in the United Kingdom. But you get the idea. It's the idea that the two of them mutually reinforce each other and provide added layers. One of them, if one of them fails, the other one is there. <laughs> and it blurs the point that there may be areas where depending on the body of law you apply, you get a slightly different answer. And that's something that's troubled me from the beginning of this debate, mainly because I come originally from the human rights law side of the equation and I was nervous that maybe uh, in going through this exercise, we were going to weaken human rights law, that we were going to carve off little pieces of it. So let me explain a couple of ways in which this, uh, the, the problems manifest themselves without providing a clear answer, because I'm not sure that I have one, but it's more a reflection, and we've been told that's what your talk was for. Um, the first is whether we need uh, the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, uh, in order to fill gaps in human rights law, or whether human rights law in and of itself does a perfectly adequate job of addressing the problems that arise in international humanitarian law. In other words, do we need this specialized body of law, or would human rights law do the trick entirely? Uh, well, the human rights law, uh, rather the law of armed conflict, as, as David explained, is sort of we could divide it into two broad categories. One is, is dealing with the protection of non-combatants and above all civilians and principally in occupied territories. And then the other is dealing more with the sort of combat related or the battlefield type of uh, issues. Choice of weapons, targeting, proportionality, and so on. As for the first part, the treatment of civilians, um, non-combatants, I think we can all see that human rights law can really largely uh, 
largely does that. That's the part of international humanitarian law that looks the most like human rights law, and most of the provisions are quite similar. We have to make little exceptions, but human rights law has room in it for dealing with things like internment during, a, uh, during a, you know, there's, there's space within human rights law to provide for that, and perhaps even for prisoners of war. Uh, when we get to the battlefield stuff, the, the, the issues of targeting and so on, what is interesting is that the, a body like the European Court of Human Rights, which is, I think, really the premier institution in terms of the interpretation of modern human rights law, with very, very sophisticated case law now. It's been in operation for, for 50 years. It has thousands of judgments. And it's had to address many of these issues, like targeting, like, like uh, proportionality. Uh, even issues concerning uh, prohibited weapons have arisen. The, the use of, uh, of poison gas in the, the Moscow theater uh, some years ago and so on. And my impression is that actually they do quite a good job of resolving those problems of armed conflict using the lens only of international human rights law. Um, in fact, they studiously avoid referring to international humanitarian law. Critics have said they should be digging into the international humanitarian law but they seem to find that in terms of the use of force by governments uh, in particular, they can address these issues quite well um, with notions of proportionality that are already part of the human rights. One last remark that, that relates to another piece of this. Um, international humanitarian law specialists will say that it is a law which governs the behavior of combatants but doesn't address the lawfulness of the conflict. And when we try to merge human rights law and international humanitarian law, uh, that distinction sometimes gets imported into human rights law. So people say, well, human rights law also uh, is not concerned about uh, who is responsible for the conflict. It's only concerned with the conduct of people in the conflict. And that's always posed a big problem for me. And I'll just give one example, and then I will stop. Um, if you think of the right, I won't talk about the right to life, but think about another right that is often uh, threatened in armed conflict, and that's the right to property. Someone's property is destroyed in a conflict. Their human rights are violated. If their property was destroyed in peacetime, we'd say that they have a claim to compensation and to, to justice for this deprivation of their right to, to, to enjoy and to use their property. Um, if it's in an armed conflict, International humanitarian law will say, well, was it a, a, a military objective that was targeted? And if the answer is yes, then we'll say, well, was the collateral damage uh, disproportionate in, concerned in, with, in comparison with the military objective? And if we come to the conclusion that it was proportionate, we're going to say to the victim of the right to property, too bad, that's lawful, you don't have a claim. And so my point is that there you get to two different answers, and I prefer the human rights answer to the answer of, the, of, uh, of international humanitarian law. But the human rights answer will say we, we do care. There's no justification for, for causing the damage um, because the, the war itself was unlawful, for example. You were using force unlawfully, and you weren't entitled to do it. The question may be different when you're in acting in defense and you can claim that you were defending yourself. But I think these issues require more explanation and that we have to avoid a simplistic um, forced marriage of humanitarian law and, and human rights law. I think it's, it's, there are complications that, that we have to resolve, um, I think largely with the view of protecting the integrity of human rights law and expanding the protection of, uh, of the individual. Thank you, Bill. And that was very fascinating. There's also a temporal issue there, right, which is that in peacetime, you wouldn't be talking at all about international humanitarian law. And so in the war on terror context, we see that blending uh, happening sort of excessively. Comments by Hans or? Did you, did you say uh, war on terror? Did you say war on terror? Sorry. The so-called war on the terror. So <laughs> <laughs> the so-called. And I did. It's a very dangerous misnomer, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think... Um, uh, I put it in quotes. Bill, yes, in quotes, yes. Um, the, um, the analysis 
I build here, I, I agree very much with, I mean, these two uh, areas are complementary. And if you go in depth in a particular situation, you will see that there is one very interesting distinction here. In a time of war, there's sometimes permitted for a state to make some derogations from human rights, whilst in humanitarian law, that applies lock, stock, and barrel. And I was confronted with this in the United Nations in the late 90s, because the issue came up, what applies to you and troops in the field? And of course, I took in the discussion a point of departure, is it legal at all to raise your gun and point, point it to a blue helmet? But when I discussed this further, the military in particular, they were adamant about they wanted international humanitarian law to apply, because this is known among soldiers, this is known in the field, so ultimately, not to make a long story, uh, too long story of this, we ended up by introducing, through a Secretary General's bulletin, humanitarian, national humanitarian law for the Blue Helmets. That is what apply in the fields. And then I was confronted with the, with the, the situation in East Timor and Kosovo. And of course, there we were in the field, we applied humanitarian law in the field, but at the same time, we were legislating and we were administering the two provinces. And then I applied the same system as I did back home. Before a proposal for legislation went to Parliament, I had an officer reviewing that proposal with human rights spectacles, and he would blow the whistle as soon as he saw that there was something problematic in the law in relation to human rights obligations. And I said to Secretary General Kofiana that it would be extremely embarrassing if the UN was issued legislation, or as we called it, regulations. I didn't want to call them laws because they are enacted by elected bodies, so they were called regulations. No regulations was issued in those two provinces without having been vetted from a human rights perspective. So I was very much aware of the interlinkage between these two, shall we say, systems, and I think they are complementary, and we should be very careful to, to preserve the integrity of the two. But in the particular case, as Bill pointed out, then you have to sit down and look very carefully at the situation and find a solution in that particular case. Thank you. David? Well, I just thought I'd point out that, um, you know, once you start talking about human rights compliance in an armed conflict situation where international humanitarian law is being applied, um, so much of human rights law is a state responsibility issue. It's not as if you can suddenly associate with those soldiers and combatants responsibilities that could lead to criminal accountability because somehow they're violating someone's human rights as opposed to a strict violation of international humanitarian law in that armed conflict. So it gets, it gets complicated because suddenly you're dealing with individual criminal responsibility in one field of law and generally state responsibility in another. And of course, even in international humanitarian law, you have states that have, uh, have ratified the Geneva Conventions and have state responsibilities as well. So um, that complexity grows as you bring these two fields together. I would just all note that I had the opportunity uh, right after um, the invasion of, of Iraq in 2003 to write an article for the American Journal of International Law on you know what's happening to the law of military occupation here because both the United Kingdom and the United States uh, acknowledged that they were military occupiers of Iraq for a certain period of time into uh, uh, 2004. Um, and of course, under the Geneva Conventions, uh, a military occupier has uh, considerable responsibilities as an occupying force. And my thesis was essentially that uh, these particular armed forces were not necessarily living up to their obligations under the Geneva Conventions as occupying forces. And part of that analysis led me to see how, how you, you cannot avoid, as a military occupying force, deep immersion in human rights law because you are in control of that society and the population depends upon you to maintain a certain environment within that society. And it's not just complying with Geneva Convention requirements for military occupation. Those requirements give rise to, in my view, uh, particularly in more recent times, a considerable number of human rights obligations that start to just flow into being a military occupier. It's not like 50 years ago 
or 60 years ago. It is in a new century with an expectation that a military occupying force will go far beyond the Geneva Conventions in terms of their responsibilities. And that's what I found so interesting in, in what I saw unfold in Iraq in 2003-2004. Very interesting. David, the next question is for you, and it ties into this nicely, because one of the provisions in the Geneva Conventions is that the parties to the conventions have to instruct, right, they have to use the, the provisions and instruct their military as to what's in the conventions so that they can comply. But the question arises, how much is that being done, and how relevant and how much is international humanitarian law um, being transmitted or being taught in law schools today because that's also a relevant consideration. And David, maybe you'll take the first crack at that I'll one. just crack at this, but you know, the expert is to my left here, um, and we've got a lot of professors in the audience, so <laughs> I'm, I'm humbly going to submit a couple of views. Um, I have witnessed um, over a 20-year period, because I was adjunct teaching in the 90s and then I went full-time after the Clinton administration, um, I've recognized a real evolution in the teaching of, of uh, well, I call it atrocity law, but international humanitarian law in the sense that um, it is a growth industry in law schools. Uh, there was a time when, when we called it, inter I mean, you know, we call it international criminal law basically as a course title. And uh, you would be hard pressed 20 years ago to find a you know, a large number of schools that have taught the subject. Um, today, there are a large number of law schools, and all the top law schools, teaching international criminal law. There is a constituency for it among the law students. There are law students who almost every day come into my office and say, I want a career doing precisely this. I want to be a prosecutor or a defense counsel before the tribunals or a judge ultimately one day, etc." So the demand is clearly there. But I want to put a, and by the way, uh, on the, uh, uh, in the, uh, I teach international human rights law as well, and, and in the case books for international human rights law, you now have these massive chapters that we did not have 10 years ago. They didn't exist. In fact, the chapter was self-determination. The self-determination cha chapter has been ripped out of the case book, and now it's international humanitarian law. It's the law of the war crimes tribunals. That's the chapter that replaces self-determination now. And, and guess what? Self-determination is on the way back. So, um, <laughs> and I still have my old lecture notes on it. Um, but um, uh, uh, the, uh, what I wanted to say was, while it's definitely a growth industry and students want to uh, learn the subject, they want to go out and have experiences with the tribunals, um, there's an interesting sector of the student body that actually wants to become uh, JAG officers um, because they find that very interesting, the war crimes uh, part of the equation. Um, it still remains a relatively limited segment of the school body. Don't think that all students are crazy about this. They aren't. They're headed for law firms and business law and, uh, and, and litigation and U.S. attorney's offices on domestic law. But I think we've reached a kind of a plateau, in my view, whereby we know we've got a fairly steady number of students every year that will take these courses and express deep interest in them. But I, I no, have not seen a huge explosion beyond that plateau for the last four years or so. Interesting. Bill? I've always wanted to try and teach the law of armed conflict um, through film and to show films, uh, com you know, uh, fiction films, not documentary films, about war and about conflict. Because I think that's actually, maybe not, not university students, but that's how most people learn about how you're supposed to behave in war. Very few of us today actually go to war. It's not like it was generations ago, the generations of our parents and grandparents who were often as not you know, put in the uniform for a few years and sent off to war. It doesn't happen very much, at least in this part of the world anymore. So where do we learn about it? Watching Tom Hanks in the, in the cinema. And I'm, I'm always I'm intrigued by how the message gets communicated. Apparently there's a new film out with, is it with Brad Pitt? 
about an American platoon in Germany yes. at the end of the war. Yes. Um, that apparently is very harsh and very nasty and shows some, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing it, not because I want to see the harsh parts, but I'm intrigued by how they'll portray what the soldiers think they can and cannot do. I'm convinced that there are some things they think they cannot do, and there are other things that they do that they think they shouldn't do, and then there are other things that they think they're entitled to do, but I don't know what that is until I've seen the film. I still remember the scene in uh, Saving Private Ryan, where uh, t Tom Hanks and his, his little group, they're behind the lines and they can't take prisoners because they can't, not they can't, they will threaten their mission. And they encounter this German who's sort of, he's shooting at them. He's not a sniper exactly, but he's in a bunker and he's shooting at them and they manage to catch him. And then some of the guys with Tom Hanks try to beat him up and they want to kill him. And uh, Tom Hanks says he can't do it. They have a fight. He's clearly in the minority, but since he's the commander, he says no. And he says, you know, turn, uh, they, they disarm him, and he says, walk a thousand face, paces in the other direction uh, without looking around, and then you're on your own. Um, probably in the textbooks, that's the right answer, you know, and it's nice that they show it in the film, except the guy that he frees up comes back at the end of the film, and he's the guy who kills him. <laughs> so what's the moral of the story, you know? Yeah. That's the message that's difficult, but there, uh, cinema's loaded with all of these these, these lessons, you know, that, that they're just a little bit, they raise more difficult questions than, you know, Alec Guinness standing there in the, in the Japanese prison camp saying, but this is the Geneva Convention, and then the Japanese commander says, you know, I spit on your Geneva Convention. But, so. Thank you. Well, let me just echo the importance of teaching uh, international humanitarian law. Uh, let me add that those students who say, well, I'm going to the business community and so forth, they should be told the following. If you go into the business community and become perhaps a general counsel of a company and you have no idea of what human rights and humanitarian law is, you are an unguided missile because this belongs to the area of corporate social responsibility. And I had the privilege of discussing this with the general counsels of ExxonMobil, General Motors and Walmart who actually had recruited uh, the former legal general counsel of the U.S. Navy, Alberto Mora, to raise the standards in their company. And they unanimously answered when I asked about the corporate social responsibility, they say, this is very high on the agenda in the boardrooms these days, and it belongs to the area risk management. If we make a mistake here, it can cost the company tremendously. So therefore, I think there should be an interest also for lawyers who intend to go into the business community to be as familiar as they can with international humanitarian law and human rights law. Thank you. Let me just add, Le Leila, that yes, that course on corporate social responsibility has now become a, a quite a, a, a popular course in, in many of the, of the top law schools in the country. Um, and it is, I agree with Hans, it's exactly where I, I teach it. And I, I find this is exactly where I can take the student in the only time they'll get exposed to international humanitarian law, because why? Because oftentimes corporations will find themselves complicit in the commission of these crimes. So it is that one slice of opportunity to take the student into this field and impress them with it. Yeah. You know, and I might add just a one finger, at least in the United States, international humanitarian law has come up a lot in the courts because of Guantanamo, because of the actions after 9-11, and we've had many major Supreme Court decisions actually looking at the Geneva Conventions, and I remember Justice O'Connor standing at the American Society of International Law and saying, we need law clerks who are actually trained in this because this area of the law is really difficult. So it has major implications if you're a country using force, obviously, to know how that force should be used. Um, let's turn to our next question, which is for you, Hans. Uh, should we continue to press hard for, uh, for further codification of international humanitarian law, that is the adoption of new treaties, right, new specific rules, or are we better off pressing for customary international law compliance by all nations, regardless of ratification status? And here you might talk about some of the new initiatives um, on autonomous weapons or on crimes against humanity as well. Thank you. Well, I think one should do both, actually. 
And the development of international law is, of course, a dynamic process, often started with what is referred to as soft law, but then takes on uh, the role of, of, of custom international law and binding rules. And if you look at, for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, that was just a declaration, not binding in those days. Today, I would say, this declaration has assumed the standard of the status of, of customer international law. And I, I think if I look back at my experience from national legislation, I served for many, many years in the Ministry of Justice, responsible for precisely legislative work, assisting the government, the cabinet, to prepare proposals for legislation to the parliament. That, that all the time new things happen, and you have to look at the existing law and realize that this is not really up to standards now. Something has happened, something in the technical field, something in the legal field, and then you have to review the legislation. So you have to have this under constant review. So my suggestion here would be that, that we should be care very careful to defend the law there is. But if there is a need to reform it, we should enter into an exercise to, to do precisely that. And of course, we have seen that in, in some fields of international law already. In the human rights field, of course, there has been a tremendous development over the years. And on the humanitarian law, uh, we see now new aspects. Uh, we will discuss tomorrow um, the um, uh, sort of uh, private companies dealing with security and uh, military operations and so forth. There might be a need there, but we can discuss that tomorrow. We have the new techniques, for example, the drones. And here I must say to you that I'm extremely worried about the drones. I mean, if you use a drone, and everybody will be using drones. I'm working a lot in the Arctic. In the Arctic, we are using drones all the time for peaceful purposes, to see how the ices are developing, temperatures, water quality, and so forth. They are used extensively for these purposes. So there's no way we are going to stop the drones. This means that this is a perfectly legitimate instrument, and all of a sudden, you put a weapon in it, and it becomes something different. And as far as I understand, if you use a drone in the battlefield, that would be permitted, and then you can strike at combatants. But if you use a drone somewhere else, and you have identified an individual who is suspected of having committed a crime, maybe a terrorist crime, if you then decide to send a drone and use a missile to kill that person, I have difficulties coming around the provision, uh, as far as I know, in the criminal law, which is called murder. To identify a person. If you identify a bank robber, he's sitting at 48th Street, uh, crossing uh, with that avenue, and you decide that, well, let's kill him. I mean, that would be a clear murder. What is the difference here if you identify people, maybe in another country, sending off a drone? And so forth. I think it's extremely important that we follow up here. Maybe the existing international humanitarian law is sufficient to solve the problem here in the manner that I suggested. So my answer to your question is that it's very important. And if you look at history, I mean, see what happened in the 18th century when we had the first conventions on, on protection of the wounded. And then came the laws on occupation. We have the expanding bullets in 1899. And then came the First World War. And what came after that? Forbidding of asphyxiating gases. Yes, gases. And then we have the Second World War when we had the Genocide Convention because of what happened in the 30s and 40s. We have the, uh, the Geneva Conventions and so forth. And then came cultural property and then landmines and whatnot. So I think the, the realities will, in a sense, give the answer to the question. If it is considered necessary to regulate a particular element, then one would do that. But for the rest, uh, I will go back to what I said from the beginning, that allow also uh, customs to develop and, and uh, impress what is already there. Yeah. I think it's, we shouldn't be um, deceived into thinking that a law is going to advance and develop quickly by more codification. I think that actually one of the curious features of this body of law, both international humanitarian law, but also international human rights law, is that it moves faster forward when you hand it over to judges and courts than when you get a group of diplomats together in a room and ask them to negotiate mm -hmm. a text. The most spectacular 
uh, legal development in the last 20 years is the famous Tadish decision of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia that just completely moved the goalposts on international law in a way that would, would have been fiercely resisted had you had a, a, a diplomatic conference at the time, I suspect. Um, and you see the same thing with, with human rights tribunals like the European Court of Human Rights where you give judges vague texts um, not too precise and they run with them uh, and develop them in unexpected and sometimes quite brilliant ways whereas if you if you try to codify it, you, it it sort of seems to tighten up we have a great example in the Rome statute in article 8 which deals with the war crimes where it's the longest provision I think it's about 1500 words long and I remember when it was being negotiated at the Rome conference people thought that the more words you put in a provision the more effective it was, the more you could do with it. And of course, the opposite is true. The broadest, if you think about it, in international criminal law, uh, certainly in the modern period, uh, let's leave Nuremberg aside, the, most, uh, the broadest and most advanced provision for war crimes uh, is Article 3 of the Statute of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the first one, because it deals with all serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in international and non-international armed conflict. It's huge. And everything else subsequent is actually smaller, including the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. David? Yeah, just a brief comment that um, since we're here in the United States, um, I, you know, we, we must recognize that within the United States government, um, there is a reality of some codification, some ratif ratification by the United States of some major treaties, obviously the Geneva Conventions, but not the protocols uh, to them. And yet we have developed a practice within the United States government of, of, of quite sophisticated analysis and then reliance upon customary international law as the basis for our country's performance. Uh, overseas. Um, that's extremely important uh, because frankly if the US Senate is not going to be ratifying relevant human rights and uh, international criminal law treaties for the foreseeable future, if anyone has better information please let me know, um, then we rely increasingly on our analysis of customary international law and what we regard as binding on the United States through customary international law. I, I need only mention, you know, the Law of the Sea Convention as well as Protocol 2 and even Protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions where our government speaks uh, quite often about the customary international law obligations that are reflected in those conventions but we're not ratified parties of those conventions. So it's not a, a uh, it's not a, a simple, uh, or it's, it's, it's a very important issue for the United States government to continue to, to grapple with because um, unless we can actually start to ratify some of these conventions, we're, we're going to be tested in the international community on whether in fact we stick to these conventions as emblematic of customary international law. Um, and I'm going to add a one finger and then Bill wants to come back in on this one too. The, the other thing is it might depend on what you want to use the law for. Because if it's a crime or a criminal prosecution, you need codification. Because it hurts the rights of the accused, essentially. You can't prosecute under customary international law. If you want to prosecute, you need criminal law. And for that, usually, if it comes from the international, you need, you need a treaty. But if it's about state behavior, Customary international law is much more appropriate. Bill, you wanted to Well, add just a, a reflection on David's finger. comment uh, and on the uh, position of the United States internationally. Of course, as David's pointed out, the United States has ratified a, a patchwork of the international treaties, and particularly in the, in the field of, of human rights and interna international humanitarian law. One of the big pieces that's always been missing here is the, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural oh, yeah. Rights, which the United States has not ratified. Uh, and until recently, there was no accounting by the United States internationally for the respect of economic, social, and cultural rights. But now there is. 
uh, when the United States comes to the Human Rights Council under the Universal Periodic Review process, it reports on education, health care, housing, to the United Nations Human Rights Council, and it's doing so under the provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and not the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which it still has, has yet to uh, accept. So it's perhaps another example of where when we, when we move out of the strict frame of treaty law, we find these sort of surprising new ways that the law expands and, and develops, and we didn't have to get the Senate's approval to, <laughs> to, to make that reporting. That was in a decision by the administration, and it, it makes very interesting reading. All right, and this is our final question formally for our panelists, and then we're gonna open it up to the floor. This one is for you, Bill. How relevant is international humanitarian law in domestic codification of law today? Well, there's certainly a lot more of it. Um, I think the Rome Statute has been a huge impetus because it's created kind of a gold standard for um, the definitions of crimes, but also obligations of cooperation on states that um, they then turn their attention to implementing. We now have more than 100 and 120 states parties to the Rome Statute. There will be more. Um, and perhaps there, there is, I don't know if this has been studied, there may even be uh, echoes of this even in states that haven't ratified the Rome Statute, but that are caught up in this wave of giving more attention to the incorporation of international humanitarian law in their domestic legal system. So it's definitely a, a phenomenon. Um, whether, it will, whether it translates into action is a, is a question I think that is, is not so clear. Um, the states have, have shown great, um, have shown considerable interest in using this body of law in their own domestic prosecutions under traditional forms of jurisdiction the, the universal jurisdiction idea, the idea that they would also prosecute international crimes uh, with which they don't have uh, a significant connection in terms of the, where the crime was committed or the nationality, has probably, it still generates a lot more heat than light. It's a, it's a favorite subject of uh, doctoral students and uh, NGOs write materials on it all the time. But finally, over the last 20 years, I mean, if we were to look at at the tribunals that our prosecutors represent, um, we're probably talking about three to four hundred people who've been prosecuted by those tribunals in the last 20 years. And under universal jurisdiction, if we added up the total, I think, uh, who did it? Massimo Langer did it in an article in the American Journal of International Law about five years ago. It's about 35 people. And most of those cases were just echoes of the ad hoc tribunal prosecutions, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Nazis. So not, not such a big deal, but in the, in the legislative changes, sure, lots of that. Mm. We had our first case under the torture convention in the United States. David, did you wanna? Yeah, just a brief point, a little more narrow, that um, uh, the Rome Statute has incentivized uh, many countries, obviously, through their ratification processes to convert uh, uh, much of international humanitarian law and domestic law. But here in the United States, interestingly, since we have not gone through that exercise of ratifying the Rome Statute, we nonetheless, um, I think, are trying to achieve a principle, um, at least I would hope we are, that the United States will not be a sanctuary for anyone who has committed the atrocity crimes which are embodied in the Rome Statute. And in order to ensure that, we have to have domestic laws that enable our government either to deport these individuals when they reach the border of the United States or to prosecute them if they firmly set foot within the United States. There has been progress in that respect. Uh, we don't have the complete panoply of Rome statute crimes now subject to federal prosecution. Um, uh, but there are efforts underway to achieve that objective. And so I think it's a very sort of hopeful sign that there, there's movement within uh, the legal communities and within our government to sort of look at this issue and say, there is no plausible, or at least this is me speaking, there's no plausible <laughs> argument that anyone in this room can make for the United States to be a sanctuary for someone who has committed 
genocide, crimes against humanity, or serious war crimes elsewhere in the world, that is not a, it's just not a plausible argument to say that this country is a sanctuary for those individuals. They can buy their property in New Mexico and Florida and live happily ever after. That is wrong. And so I favor the idea that we have legislation and laws on the book that prevent that. And that indeed would then be bringing all of that into U.S. law. Hmm. Yes, I think it is relevant to answer that question briefly. And I hope it will be more relevant indeed when in a few years time we will have a new convention on crimes against humanity. Amen. <laughs> so we started at sort of the highest level of abstraction in a sense of international humanitarian law at the international level at the Security Council. You heard about it application at the ad hoc tribunals and the International Criminal Court this morning and now we came back all the way down to national courts right national legislation trying to implement this law and do something about deterrence prevention um, and prosecution. So now it's your turn to ask questions for our panelists. And please, sir, you have the first question. Which one of my panelists wants to, maybe, let's answer that one uh, quickly and then yeah, we'll take a quickly. couple more. Yeah, just quickly. It is Tito's Yugoslavia. It's, it's Serbia. It's Montenegro. It's Bosnia and Herzegovina, Slovenia, Croatia, and, well, we'll call it Macedonia for the moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into Firem. Um, it's, it's those, Kosovo. and Kosovo. Well, Kosovo is, well, yeah, Kosovo as a, <laughs> formerly part of Serbia and of the former Yugoslavia. Um, that's the area we're speaking about. The Cold War Yugoslavia is what we mean by former Yugoslavia. So the tribunal was established to cover the oh. territory of the former Yugoslavia. Um, yes. Oh, great question. I mean, maybe we should take two or three. Um, what, did I see another question in the front? Yeah, the young lady with the glasses. Great question. And maybe one more? Yeah, the gentleman in the front. Okay, three great questions. Who wants to take the first one? Bill, I think that's, yeah. that's yeah. My, my area. Well, the question uh, that was asked was about what is this problem of the extraterritorial reach of human rights conventions, and this is a, a controversial issue in international law. Uh, the, there, there's a good argument that at the time that the conventions were initially adopted in the late 1940s and early 1950s, or when they were being negotiated, that states believe that they only apply to their metropolitan territory. In other words, for, for the United Kingdom, uh, it meant the islands and it didn't mean the colonies. And that's why they put in provisions in these treaties saying that they could also make a declaration extending the application to the colonies. More recently, and that's an example again of this creative uh, role of judges and, uh, and, and similar uh, quasi-judicial uh, bodies, is that that ha has been changed and that more and more the prevailing view is that the, uh, the obligations under the human rights treaties extend also to your conduct outside of your territory. Um, and uh, it may, uh, the, the scope of that, the extent of that is still a matter of also of, of much debate. Uh, if you occupy a territory, I think the, there's a very strong case that you 
that it applies, that your human rights obligations apply to you. And uh, then the question is, going further afield, when we're talking about armed conflict, does it deal with the conduct of your forces when you don't control the territory? And, and there I think that the, the, the debate is still raging on this. I have another take uh, on this as well, and it's partly my you know, great enthusiasm for uh, customary law and for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that is that the treaties, and this is where there's an interesting uh, comparison with the law, with international humanitarian law, where we tend not to be too obsessed about the treaties because we say it's all customary law anyway, and it applies to everybody, not just to the states, but to the non-state actors and to the individuals. It's my belief that that's the same with human rights law. The human rights obligations, if you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it speaks to everybody. It doesn't just speak to the state. It's very clear. It's speaking, you can read it, it's a short document, and it speaks to all of us. It speaks to organizations, it speaks to institutions, it speaks to people, as well as to states. Um, so that a, a, a country, regardless of what the treaty says, and it's a that's a problem of treaty interpretation, Maybe there is a treaty, maybe there's no treaty. But it doesn't mean that the state isn't required to, to respect these broader human rights obligations that flow from customary international law and from the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So that's, that's a very radical answer, in a way, to the question. But I think that's where the answer lies, that we have to say that, um, so that the United States, for example, could say, before the Human Rights Committee, which is the body to which it reports under the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, we don't have to report on anything we, that happens outside of our territory. And the Human Rights Committee will throw a temper tantrum and tell them they're wrong and everything, but they'll, you know, there'll be a standoff and that'll be the end of it. But when they go to the Human Rights Council where they're reporting under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I don't think they have that argument about the scope of the treaty, the interpretation of the treaty, the intent of the drafters, I think there, we have to say, when our soldiers go abroad, they have to respect the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we'll thank Rene, Ke Rene Kelsan, and Eleanor, and Eleanor Roosevelt. Roosevelt, the great yeah. Eleanor Roosevelt. Okay. Hans, did you want to jump in on that well, or on the Security Council question? Yeah, yeah well, the responsibility to protect. Uh, here, I'm very sensitive to, to this question, and I've heard the suggestions even in my own country that if the um, the Security Council is not up to standards here. Somebody else has to intervene, and many people think about NATO. I, I warn uh, against that. Certainly, I recognize that there could be a system of sheer necessity, that somebody has to do something. And I thought of, of, of the arguments here about Kosovo in 1999, but I was very concerned when, when the uh, intervention in Kosovo occurred, because two things will happen. First of all, uh, there's a tendency, at least in Western countries, that they believe that it would be NATO or some sort of ordinary uh, organized uh, troop that would do the thing. Uh, but uh, who can be sure? And the second thing is that you lift the burden, quote unquote, from the shoulders of the Security Council. They should be standing held against the wall and say, well, you have to do something about it. And I warned the Council also that if they continue not to perform in a situation where the whole world sees that something should be done. Maybe they undermine the United Nations in a manner that perhaps the organization risks becoming irrelevant. Now they would say, well, if the UN wasn't there, we would have to invent it. This is a very sloppy argument. The UN Charter is the heritage of a generation that experienced two world wars. We would be very careful to honor that heritage because if a new organization is set up, I've said to the five members, the permanent members, you will never ever in a new organization be given the legal power you have under the UN Charter to sit permanently, permanently on an organ with the legal power to adopt resolutions that the whole membership of the organization is obliged to follow. So if I, I wish I could be present when the permanent five sit down and discuss and we do really make them understand that they have a tremendous privilege here to actually contribute to peace and security in the world. And the second element here on the responsibility to protect, if you open the doors and the council says, well, somebody will deal with it, then we are back before 1914 in the world again. Because it's not only NATO that will say, well, we can do this or that. Anybody can do it. And then we have, 
destroyed the whole thing with the, with the UN Charter. Finally, on the human rights, I agree with what Bill said here. And I would say in my country, I defended Sweden for 11 years during when I was legal counsel of the Foreign Office in Stockholm uh, before the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg. And it was an extremely useful learning experience for my country. And when I had to explain a lost case, this was done in a sitting cabinet meeting in those days. I found myself assuming the role of the defender of the court. We've analyzed the judgment, there's nothing wrong with it, and the only thing we can do here is now to fulfill our obligation and execute the judgment. But more importantly, if you lose a case, why did we do so? Often the analysis leads to the conclusion that the legislation is at fault, and you have to review the legislation in that particular field. This was a very, very uh, important learning experience for us. And finally, in the UN, when we govern Kosovo and East Timor, the UN is not formally bound by the human rights treaties. But I was adamant that Kofi Annan was completely in the picture here, that under no circumstances should the UN be committing or doing things in these territories or regions that would violate international human rights standards. That would be an anomaly. We simply can't do that. So we considered ourselves bound by the treaties in those regions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. David, did you want to add to? Well, I want to add on responses? R2P, but let you go with the uh, uh, Crimes oh. Against Humanity Convention question. I think that was asked to you. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. I mean, it really goes to the same thing we've been talking about, is there are different levels at which hum international humanitarian law or international criminal law are being applied. Sometimes it's being applied at the international level by an international court, and in that case, that international court is taking a piece of law in its own treaty, in the case of the ICC, because the ICC statute has the criminal law and all the rules for establishing the court in one treaty. And then the court takes the piece of law that says crimes against humanity and applies it to the situations in which it has jurisdiction. There are lots of states not parties to the ICC, and of course what the ICC can do has nothing to do with what national states should be actually doing, which is prosecuting crimes against humanity cases. And for them to do that effectively at the international level in terms of transnational cooperation, international cooperation with each other, the kind of situation Ambassador Sheffer was talking about where you have a state that's actually a, sort of a sanctuary for an individual who may have committed the crime in another state, um, or you have a person at large, you need interstate modalities, extradition, out debtere, out judicare, you need provisions on statute of limitation, you need provisions on modes of liability and uh, superior orders, so things like that. It's really an interstate process. And that's when, it sounds like an alphabet soup, but international law has these subsets, international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and then international criminal law. And so the model in international criminal law, which also applies to hostage taking, terrorism, corruption, money laundering, um, I might suggest should also apply to crimes against humanity, which is one of the most serious crimes that can be committed. So that's the difference. Yeah. David? Oh, just a further point on R2P. We certainly aspire to what Hans has, has wisely counseled about, you know, the Security Council rising to the occasion, accepting its own responsibility to use its charter authorities to do the right thing, and particularly to protect civilian populations at risk. And the responsibility to protect principle vests that authority in the Security Council. It doesn't vest it in anyone else other than in the first instance the, the country itself where the problem arises has a responsibility, but then if it fails, you go to the Security Council and there's a very clear procedure for that. The problem is, uh, and, and I think we have to address the problem, we cannot ignore it, of course, is if the Security Council fails to step up to the plate, if the responsibility to protect principle is too narrowly constructed now to achieve its objective of saving human lives, we have to find some other solution. Now, we want to find it under international law, um, but I don't think we want to argue that, that there's a gap in international law we can't fill here. And I increasingly find myself going back to more traditional principles of international law which have not been wiped away at all yet, whether it be under the doctrine of humanitarian intervention, under principles of collective self-defense. There are ways to 
look to international law to achieve an objective that I think most civilized nations would say we must achieve that objective, namely save thousands of lives if possible from senseless and, and frankly criminal uh, elimination or, or extermination. So I just think, you know, there's more out there than uh, is technically on the books right now and, and what we're talking about. And uh, our governments in, in Europe and in the United States in particular, I think, need to be very, very constructive and cooperative in how they look at international law and try to find solutions rather than obstacles. Could I just fill in there that I agree, uh, David, uh, I, I didn't have time to develop it too much, but, but I think that what one would first re require is that the council analyzes the situation, and they should do that by using the five criteria that the um, uh, commission set up, uh, that was um, Axworthy's commission. Yeah, and, and, and then you had um, the, the, the last criterion, I think, is so important that if in the analysis, the answer is that if we intervene with, with, with force, with military force, we may create a situation that is worse than if we don't intervene. Then I think the whole world would understand if the council stepped back. But if the council could to take the step and doesn't do it, yes, one has to look very carefully at it. And I said I wouldn't exclude a, a, a situation of necessity. But as you know rather well, the General Assembly and the council has said that we are the ones who are intervening if necessary by force under Chapter 7. Uh, um, paragraphs 138 to 139, is it in? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, but but I, I agree that we have to look carefully at this. But, but the first step is really to ask the five family members to sit down, look at themselves, and ask the question, what are we doing? If we continue like this, we are actually feeding conflicts in the world instead of reaching out to each other and demonstrating to the world that if somebody pass a line here, we will come after you. Well, I was going to see okay. if we had time for one more question, but if not, we, it's 15.58. We have two minutes. Um, is there one more question very quickly? And then each one of the panelists perhaps has one final thought to leave us with. Yes. Great question, and maybe if we'll just broaden it to the what can I do, and have each one of the panelists just conclude with their positive, hopeful statement about <laughs> what we can do. <laughs> David? Uh, well, I, I, I answer this question fairly often, and it has so many different avenues you can go down that it, it's not a simplistic answer. There are so many ways to get involved with non-governmental organizations as a student wh while you're either in class or during the summer. I mean, there are all sorts of ways to get intersected with NGOs. So that's a long discussion with any student. You want to know what their interests are, et cetera, and then you start walking them down that path. But I also tell other students, particularly those, you know, my, my corporate law types who are just kind of tolerating me a little bit, um, <laughs> that um, I say, look, the, that the least I want you to do is I want you to read about this stuff every day in the paper this term. Mm -hmm. I want you to sensitize yourself because when you get out there in the professional world, by God, if you're in a law firm, I want you doing pro bono work and I want you aware of this and I want you energized by it. So there are different ways with different types of students to try to, to, uh, to energize them. I do, these days, most of my teaching in England and France, and I've been reminding my students in recent months that if it were 100 years ago, um, about 
half of the students in the class within the next 12 to 18 months would be dead. Um, you know, that that was, that was what it was like 100 years ago in a university classroom. And the, 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 the universities of Europe, but it's the case here as well, all have plaques to the, those who died in the wars. Um, and uh, we don't have so much anymore. Uh, as Steven Pinker says, it's never been safer to be a young man in the United States today than, than in history. Um, so I think that's the thing we have to cherish. I wanted to jump in on the discussion about the responsibility to protect people because I think that we often too quickly uh, d uh, reduce it down to a discussion about the use of force, whereas so much of it is about other types of initiatives and uh, that that's really what's so rich about that doctrine that you can, you know, the, the solution rarely, as Han said, most of what we've seen in terms of intervention allegedly to prevent human rights in the last decade or two appears to have done a lot more harm than, than good, actually. It's just made more people miserable. And so I, I think be very careful about that. And the last thing for students is to remember that what Eleanor Roosevelt said, that human rights begin in small places close to home. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a funny one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I almost <laughs> maybe I, I was uh, I was agreeing here, but um, <laughs> what I would like to say is that uh, um, the human rights issues are taken in small steps, and what I see as very important in any society are the non-governmental organisations. I never forget my meeting with the non-governmental organisations in Cambodia when I was negotiating the treaty there, a very humble crowd who said that they were not so interested in the court as they were interested in finding out the truth about what had happened to them near and dear. And uh, I've seen this in other places too in the world. And what I fear now is that young people are, how can you make them look up from the mobile that was <laughs> sounding in my pocket? And I mean, when I look at them in the streets in my own country, I mean, they don't see other people. If somebody, an old lady, comes into the bus, I'm the one who leaves my seat open. The others are sitting like this. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, a, it, it's very important to engage one, young people in this, that they form organizations, join organizations, and also try to influence the leadership. <laughs> Finally, let me close on another poem, which I used when I was invited to give a keynote speech for the American Society of International Law with them. Attorney General John Reno on the first row. I had been informed that members of Congress was boasting about not having passports. So I came to think of one of the sayings of the Vikings written more than a thousand years ago. In translation from the beautiful Icelandic, it goes, wise is a man who has traveled far and knows the ways of the world. He who has traveled can tell what spirit governs the men he meets. Today, of course, it would have been men and women. And the only protection when they went around in their open longboats against the wrath of the elements was the dragon's head at the stern of the ship. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I think we'll close this wonderful and very rich panel. Thank you all for your uh, participation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, panelists. And we're ending on time. One thing that uh, we are always blessed at the, at the international dialogues is to have students that join us and participate in the dialogues. And this year we have a number of students from Case University, Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Let me see, where are you all? Raise your hands. We, of course, have students, high school students, from the uh, Summer Institute for Human Rights and Genocide Studies, please raise your hand. That's great. From uh, New York University, we have students. There we go. Syracuse University, we have students. Washington University. So we are blessed with a lot of students that participate in this. And that's what the next session today is about, the Clayton Sweeney Port Session, which we're going to begin in just a few minutes right here in this room is for the uh, students.
is for the students to have a chance to talk to the prosecutors. For the rest of you, we have shuttles outside waiting to take you back to the hotel. The student session this afternoon is webcasting is made possible by the International Bar Association. So we're pleased that this session will also be webcast as it's going on. Uh, of course, our uh, reception this evening on the porches at the before dinner reception on the porches at the hotel is sponsored by the American Bar Association.